Our next speaker is going to take, take all this stuff that we've inherited today and we're going to make a profit from it. And that's his title, or that's the title we've given him, I guess, is Dr. Aaron Gaines. He comes to us from the University of Missouri three times. All three degrees are from the University of Missouri. His major advisor in Missouri was Dr. Gary Alley. Is he still here? Stand up. Let's have a look at you. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Those that don't know that uh, Dr. Alley was here some years ago and transferred to Missouri to uh, help them out. Is that the right one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Mashop uh, organization is kind of interesting in that it's, uh, he joined it in 2007 as director of nutrition. And it's a group of 250 farms, production farms. And today he serves as vice president, I gotta get this right, vice president of technical resources and support operations. And I'll let you fill that out if you wish, okay? <laughs> okay, he lives in northeast uh, Missouri with his wife, uh, Samania, Samel, Samel, Selena. Selena, okay. And he continues his education with two daughters there. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> also, as a sideline, he, he got distracted and he's developing some deer rations uh, to help grow big racks, I guess. Okay? Yeah. With that introduction, help me inter uh, welcome Aaron. Well, uh, thank you, Pat. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak at my first ever Swine Day. So, Jim. Appreciate the invitation back in March. You're welcome. Uh, I did put an introduction here. I didn't know Pat was going to introduce me, but uh, I'm thankful that the swine day wasn't last week because it wasn't a good uh, last week if you're at Mizzou. So, uh, so we'll move past that, right, Sheldon? All right. So I want to take a, just a few minutes uh, to introduce the Mashoffs. Uh, some of you probably know, know the organization, but uh, I'll hit this fairly quickly, then we'll get into profitability. Uh, so uh, the company I work for is a family-owned company. Uh, it's fifth-generation family farmers uh, owned by uh, Ken and Julie Mashoff and Dave and Karen Mashoff. You might know Ken. Uh, he serves on the National Pork Producers Council as uh, vice president. Uh, located in uh, southern Illinois uh, in Carlisle. Uh, it's about an hour east of St. Louis. We have about 750 production sites. And uh, our company's a little bit unique in the fact we do rely on uh, family farms in terms of our uh, production network. So we've got uh, 550 uh, family farms we work with. We've got about 1,300 employees. When I started in 2007, it's about 500, and it's up to uh, 1,300. So we've grown at a rate of about 20%. I talked to a class yesterday. And so coming in 2007 to today, it's been a, a roller coaster ride. Um, a lot of opportunity. We do uh, market about five million pigs. Uh, we actually uh, sell to, actually today it's three external customers with a recent uh, acquisition. And then uh, we do uh, have a co-packing agreement uh, with uh, Pine Ridge Farms where we actually have a Mashaw Family Farms label and that goes into the St. Louis market. Uh, so we are not, we're not integrated. We don't own any packing. I uh, told the group yesterday uh, we consider ourselves virtually integrated. Uh, so we work with uh, three of our customers on uh, ways to increase uh, value in the supply chain. Uh, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge uh, some of my partners in crime, uh, the president of the company, Bradley Walter, and then our uh, CFO, Jeff Deason. I uh, also want to thank uh, Greg Bilbrey. Uh, some of you probably worked with Greg. Uh, if you're a part of AgriStats, but uh, Greg was kind enough uh, to give me a lot of data to do some profitability analysis. So we're going to start out with uh, why is profitability important? And really, uh, profit is money in the bank. And uh, Jim, you mentioned this earlier. Bottom line is no business is going to survive without making a profit. Uh, several metrics are used by production companies uh, to determine success or failure. Ultimately, they all tie back to profitability, but in 2014, I think Keith Hayden, Keith, if you're in the audience, hold your hand up. I think he said it really well. 
uh, is really there's only one metric that exists, and that's profit. So this is a fairly simple equation, uh, but profit is revenue minus expenses. And so there's three ways to increase profit. One is to increase revenue. Second one is to lower your expenses. Or three, do both. If you guys are watching future prices today, pig prices are up, which is a good thing uh, because they've tanked here in, uh, in the last few weeks. So it's nice to see them uh, at least pop back up, but corn's up as well. So. Uh, breaking down the components of profitability, on the revenue side we've got carcass pounds and we've got sales price. You break down the cost bucket, you've got feed, you've got yardage, which yardage is going to be your facilities, your labor, your R&M, you've got vet med cost, you've got breeding stock depreciation, you've got freight on your wean pigs, your feeder pigs, your market hogs, and you've got semen. So as you break down this even further in terms of the revenue components, You've got your carcass pound sold, and that's coming from two sources. We call it grade A in our system, or you can call it full value pigs, and also uh, pigs that are non-grade A, or your coal pigs. About 99% of your uh, total market hog sales are grade A pigs, about 1% are non-grade A. Then you start breaking down the uh, cost components. Uh, there's three buckets that represent 95% of your operating expense probably been told time and time again, feed's a major contributor to that at 67%. Uh, feed's gonna encompass ingredients, your manufacturing cost, grind mix, pellet and delivery. And then you've got uh, yardage costs that represent 24% of the operating expense. And I think a lot of times we think feed certainly is a big chunk of our operating expense, but yardage is also a big opportunity. Uh, Mike, when you're talking about the calculator in terms of different uh, stocking strategies within a system. That's a big opportunity uh, to improve your, uh, your yardage cost through space optimization. Uh, you also got uh, labor in there, uh, utilities and R&M. On the vet med side, a much smaller bucket uh, at 4% of your operating expense. It's gonna include your vets, your vaccines, antibiotics and health supplies. And so it really becomes comes down to the question, what factors are driving profitability? And so I really took two approaches to answer this question. Uh, the first one was a profit factor analysis. Uh, actually, Greg Bilbrey uh, worked with Iowa State on this method, uh, so I'm gonna introduce that to you. And the second approach I took was just a multivariate regression analysis. Uh, we did use Agristat's data. Uh, Agristat's uh, keys roughly probably two million sows little north of that, so a lot of data here. I do wanna put out some disclaimers here on the data. Uh, the data is confounded, but we're accepting that as part of this analysis. It's a very large data set, so certainly you can poke holes in it. And then uh, the second point here is, uh, I am running the risk today of being Mr. Obvious on identifying key profit drivers. So Jim has certainly hyped this talk up this afternoon but there's probably not gonna be a lot of surprises. It may give you some assurance that you're working on the right things. So I put this cartoon in here as I thought about the presentation around Mr. Obvious. So it says, I've discovered that one very effective way to lower your taxes is not to make any money. <laughs> so this profit factor analysis, I'll go back to this one. This is the one that uh, Greg has worked with Iowa State on. I'll kind of walk through the methodology, but we basically uh, took data from 2007 to 2014, and there's 14 production and cost measures in that data set. And what we've done is basically taken the means for the top 25% in profitability and compared those to the overall average and looked at the variance. We looked at that, that variance and converted it to a percentage, and then we ranked that percentage from one to 14 based on those production and cost measurements. The actual measurements that have the highest variability would indicate that's where the top 25% have the greatest advantage, okay? So the 14 measurements that are in that data set are net sales, coal pounds, finishing weight, finishing age, mortality, average daily gain, fee conversion, and then there's a adjusted fee conversion, it's basically a caloric fee conversion Finishing cost, overall cost, wean pig cost, litters per sow per year, born alive, pre-wean mortality. When I say the data is confounded, we've got sales on here. 
So in AgriStats, there's a lot of integrator companies. Uh, it gets confounded because there's a transfer price. Probably really don't know what the, the revenue side is because they're selling each other. So that's an example of some of this confounding uh, pieces of the data. But when you rank these different uh, measurements from one to 14, I picked out the top seven. And so the top seven are percent coal pounds, proving mortality, finishing mortality, cost per wean pig, cost per finished pig, diet cost and sales price in that order. So what that's telling us is that's where the top 25% in profitability have the big, biggest advantage to the overall population. Probably not a big surprise there. Now the second approach we took was this regression analysis. Again, confounding's there, we accepted it. Uh, we did make efforts to reduce codependence of certain variables. And then again, it's the same 14 production and cost measurements. Uh, this time we actually grabbed another year's worth of data. Uh, went from 2006 to 2014, 433 observations in the data set. Uh, the goal was really to understand how much of the variation in, in net profit was explained by those 14 production and cost measures. And so if you're not, you don't have to be an expert in regression analysis. Uh, so what we focused on was a coefficient of determination or R squared value. So which ranges from zero to one. So if that R squared value is a one, that indicates that the regression line is a perfect fit for the data. If it's closer to zero, that means that the data doesn't fit at all, okay? So as you move from zero to one, that means you got a better fit of the data. So set this slide up here uh, a little bit. We've got uh, the actual uh, X variables that uh, come into the model, and then we've got their contribution to the R squared value, the cumulative contribution, and then we've got the change in R squared value as we add one of those production or cost measurements. And then we've got the percentage of the total R squared explained by that actual measurement. And I'm gonna focus on this column over here to the right um, here in a second. But when you take these five variables and put them into the model, they explain 85% of the variation in net profit. Those variables being feed cost per pound of gain, net price, or the price you receive for the pigs, your wean pig cost, finishing weight, and finishing mortality. Probably not a big surprise uh, that feed cost explained 48% of that total R squared value, followed by net price, then wean pig cost at 6.75%, and then finishing weight and mortality. When we reviewed this with AgriStats, it was somewhat interesting because we felt that mortality would have a bigger uh, R, a higher R squared contribution in the model. And what's happened through time, Keith, you've probably seen this data, is a lot of those uh, companies have narrowed the, the difference between each other in terms of the mortality spread over time. They've all got closer together in terms of mortality. So that's something I want to caution us on, on this data, that uh, it's gotten better over time. So that's something I want to be very cautious on of saying, hey, mortality is not important. So this brings us to the next question. What's my profit problem? Do I have a revenue problem? Do I have a cost problem? Hell, do I have both problems? <laughs> There's some days we do. And so one of the things that uh, you know, becomes pretty valuable is actually to look at benchmarking. Uh, some of you may be on benchmarking, some of you may not. Um, I've actually become probably more of a fan of it uh, with certain benchmarking uh, programs. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, certainly this is not a sales pitch for, for AgriStats. It's one of many benchmarking services. What's nice about it is, and I want to show this example, is it allows you to pinpoint opportunities in your operation. And so this example is really a cost production index and the red bar uh, is, the a is the average of the producers in this benchmarking data set. And then the blue bar is a producer. It can be any producer. It's an individual producer. And through time, this producer had a really good cost of production compared to the average of the population. Every year, that person was better than average until 2014 hit. And at that point, they had a higher cost of production. So, 
using benchmarking, the next step would be, hey, I've got a problem, a cost of production problem. I need to dig into this and go back to the components of profit or look at the cost breakdown. And we know that three areas represent about 95% of the cost, and it's feed, yardage, and vet med. And so this allows you to go in there and start doing a cost of production bridge on, hey, how's my feed cost? How's my yardage cost? How's my vet med cost? And from there, you can start setting improvement goals with your team. And so the last point I want to make is once you identify those opportunities, make sure you don't suboptimize profitability. Trying to focus on one specific improvement goal. And the example I'll give you is back to feed cost. So if you've got a feed cost problem, having the best feed conversion in the industry may not be the best profitability for an operation. There's companies in the U.S. that went broke and they've had, the hot, they've had the best fee conversion in the industry. So make sure you don't sub-optimize as you start looking at uh, improvement goals within your operation. So the focus for our company uh, is really in two areas. And this one's one, uh, it's an acronym. We have a lot of acronyms. I'm Dale Olden Camp, if you're in the audience. Uh, uh, but we use a lot of crazy acronyms at the mash-offs. You've got to be there for at least five years to even speak the language. So this first one's called uh, CAEBIT, Commodity Adjusted EBIT, or Earnings Before, before Interest and in Taxes. Simply put, it's a proxy for net profit. And so we look at uh, this metric, and what we do is we standardize market hog prices uh, back to an equilibrium level, and we also standardize our feed cost for corn, soy, and dry distiller's grains pricing. And the reason we do that is we try to take all the noise out of our production team's life as it relates to market volatility. Because over time, what happens is when they get their P&L and something, we've got a variance, they're going to blame pig prices, they're going to blame high corn prices. So this is a way to take that noise out and really look at well how well the production team is utilizing those resources, whether it's feed, whether it's the facilities, whether it's vet med cost. And so what's in their control is how well they sort the pigs, that drives revenue in the system, and then again, how well they utilize the resources. The other focus area is uh, grade A pounds per sow per year. Uh, this is really our throughput metric focused on PSY and wean to market mortality. I mentioned earlier on that regression analysis that mortality didn't come into play. Uh, it wasn't that high a contribution to explain that profit, but I'll tell you, we put a lot of emphasis on mortality. You have to, it's, it's a major contributor to throughput. So you start uh, breaking down the profitability equation, and these numbers are out of our system. They're going to be different for everybody's system in terms of how you value certain, certain measurements. Uh, but this is the profitability impact of a 1% unit improvement in each one of these uh, particular measures. So this is load standard deviation on tops and mid-cuts. If we can improve that by a full percentage unit, that's two cents a hundred weight. If we can improve our grade A percentage, that's 59 cents a hundred weight, well over a dollar a pig. Uh, feed cost, if we can improve that by a percent, that's 46 cents. PSY, 24 cents. Yardage, 16 cents. And then vet med, 3 cents. So we put a lot of emphasis, you know, in, in improving grade A percentage, improving our feed cost, and getting volume. And of course, you've got to have focus on yardage cost as well and, and optimizing that space on those fixed assets. So summary thoughts. Uh, need to understand what your opportunity is to increase profitability. Uh, as I look at the key profit drivers for, for success uh, in the pork industry, it's really increasing sales volume of full value pigs and lowering your cost of production with heavy emphasis on feed because it's representing 67% of your operating expense and also your wean pig cost. Benchmarking, uh, again, I think that's a valuable exercise of benchmarking versus your competitors. This will help you identify revenue and or cost improvement opportunities for your operation. And then lastly, uh, this is a people business. We have to work with our teams to establish these improvement goals and focus on the controllable factors within your operation. With that, I'd uh, be happy to answer any questions.
questions? I wondered if it was worse uh, being the speaker before lunch or the speaker before ice cream. So, got a question here. on uh, this previous slide here. Yeah, where, where that actually hits, that's in our yardage cost. That's where it gets lumped into, but certainly a, a big driver. That's one of our focus areas is how do we get freight costs down and, and re reduce the number of deadhead miles and uh, try to do optimization within the system. But that's certainly, it falls in that yardage bucket. Thank you. Yeah, so the question was around uh, how do we standardize our feed pricing and what we do is a five-year equilibrium pricing. And so uh, currently uh, we've uh, actually need to update that. We use $5 corn, uh, $3.50 meal, and then uh, dry distiller's grains uh, are right at 92% of corn price. And then uh, for carcass price on hogs at 80 bucks. But uh, we'll go through each year and update that. We should be updating that each year. Um, based on uh, historical pricing. Gary? Yeah, good question. Uh, so one of the, uh, back in 2007 when we started uh, pelleting diets, uh, when corn uh, hit $7, uh, we probably got a little too cute on, on particle size in northwest Iowa. Uh, Dale Oldenkamp's in here, he probably remembers that really well. Uh, but we, uh, we had some ulcer issues, and so uh, all the trial data we actually did uh, at the time was at the same particle size, meal versus pellet. So we took a, a step back and said, hey, we don't want to cause production any headaches with ulcer pigs and increased mortality. So we went back to the same particle size as our meal diets, uh, and we've been there for some time. Um, and so ulcers have really not been an issue for us as it relates to pelleting. And then most recently we've done some trial work uh, of trying to reduce particle size uh, even further. We've uh, had some changes in our genetic program. Uh, our newer genetic lines seem like they're more forgiving on some of the lower particle sizes. And so that's kind of the direction we're moving. Uh, but it's something you definitely got to be aware of uh, in terms of what, uh, the, how well your pigs can handle those lower particle size and you start throwing disease and other stressors on it, uh, it certainly can creep up on you. What's that? Critical point for weaning age. Ah, oh, critical point for weaning age. Um, so f within our system, we, uh, uh, wean at about 21 days of age uh, within our system. But one, um, there's a lot of good data. Case data has a lot of good data uh, uh, on wean age. The piece that we don't feel like we've got to get a handle on is probably the impact on reproductive performance and wean age. But, uh, you know, a lot of the models we actually use uh, for uh, wean age is actually uh, a lot of the data from Kansas State. But again, the, the sow data, we've not generated internally. I think that's a challenge we need to understand uh, as an industry is what the implications are uh, on reproductive performance in the sow. Aaron, yesterday you described your technology team. Could you share what you could almost have, in theory, you could have your own ASU flying day at Mass Out, right? Yeah. With a number of scientists. I, I think for the industry it's a little unique to how you guys are hired and the emphasis Mass Out has put on research. Can you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so we've made a, uh, go back to the family. I mean, it really started with Wayne Mashoff. Uh, uh, if you don't know Wayne, he's in his 80s. Uh, he's a very conservative uh, German. Uh, and uh, so you look through time, he was really the innovator within the Mashoffs and the, his boys had taken that over. One of the first confinement facilities built in Illinois was uh, built by Wayne. Uh, one of the first uh, on-farm feed mills uh, was built by Wayne. He got mad at the feed company sticking him. So no offense to the feed companies. I worked for him, but uh, he did his own thing. And uh, there's just a lot of innovation. Started doing, building his own buildings, his own slats. And so 
we've got a really deep rooted history in terms of innovation and so uh, we've made continued investments there. We've got, uh, told the group yesterday, half a dozen PhDs. I think some days they probably think there's six too many. Uh, but uh, a lot of master's students and then uh, the company's invested in research facilities. So there are commercial research facilities, uh, similar to our production facilities that are set up to do uh, more data capture as far as feed intake records and the ability to weigh and ultrasound animals. Um, and then we also partner with uh, universities. So we're not uh, a closed system by any means. Uh, students are a big part of, uh, of our organization. We've actually uh, had an internship program for some time, uh, pulling uh, students from all over the Midwest uh, into that internship program. But uh, Jim asked me yesterday, what are the top three challenges for, for you guys as an industry? And I said, people, people, and people. So uh, you students that are in the audience, you got a bright future in the swine industry, uh, but it is gonna be one of our challenges as an industry of finding good people. Uh, and Charles, you talk about being the power washer. Power washer is one of the most important jobs in our operation, man. So, if you like it, I work on weekends. Hey, perfect. <laughs> we'll take you. If Noel doesn't get you first. <laughs> yeah, commercial. I was wondering, you know, you've taken the market effect out of your comparison to other operations, but is there a frequency or how often should an operation compare with others? Yeah, so what we do on benchmarking, uh, it's a monthly comparison is what we do, and I don't want to mislead anybody that on the Kamai adjusted, we run a Kamai adjusted P&L, but we also run a real P&L. Uh, our CFO wouldn't let us get by with that, but uh, uh, so some of us are accountable to the real one, and, and some of the people are accountable to the adjusted one. And, and unfortunately, I'm not uh, on the adjusted one, but, uh, <laughs> but each month we do those comparisons. Um, and we take a different approach with benchmarking. We, we do not use it as a stick with our people. Uh, we use it as a guide to look for opportunities, but benchmarking programs can be misused in operations, and they have in the past. So, uh, but I think they do point you in the right direction on things you need to work on. Set the standard, yeah. Yep. I love your idea of virtual integration. It sounds good, but how long or how often do you discuss this discussion of vertical integration come up within the group? Owning the, the rest of it. Yeah, uh, so I, we throw out the term virtual integration and uh, we don't have the expertise uh, on the packing side. So uh, until about two years ago, we acquired a, a chicken company, uh, Golden Plump, and that's really been our first uh, venture into actually having the live animal and the processing side of the supply chain. And so uh, we're still learning that as a business. Uh, it's really uh, not our hedgehog is really to own packing. It's really the focus on the live animal side. It's what we're good at, uh, or what we aspire to be good at each day. Uh, but I think at this point, uh, just with our growth, uh, packing right now would be a big distraction for us. But will it happen in the future? Uh, it could, as we learn more about that uh, from our friends over in poultry and even our arrangement with Pine Ridge. I mean, part of that was to really give us some exposure on the packing side and understand those margins a little bit better and what the opportunities were. Yeah. Do we hedge? Yeah, absolutely. That's a big, big strategy of ours is risk management. So yeah, we have a, a hedging group that does uh, both the pigs and grain side. Uh, where's the cost go? Yeah, it's not, I don't have it in there, but certainly it's on our, on our P&L side. Uh, we run a hedging gain and loss uh, line item on, on the P&L. Um, and of course, usually, if it works correctly, it should offset <laughs> everything. Uh, but uh, it's not up there, but good question. Charles. Yeah, so on the, on the pelting side, uh, as, we, as we've done trials, uh, you know, they've matched up fairly well with some of the empirical data in terms of feed conversion response. Uh, but certainly pelting has offered us the ability to get more aggressive on some of the uh, ingredients uh, that typically in a meal diet cause some flowability challenges. Uh, 
uh, particularly in, in the summer months. Um, so it's been really both, Charles, to be able to leverage the improvements with pelleting just through a change in feed form and then be able to capture additional value by using some of the ingredients that are harder to use in meal form. That's a good question. That's a good debate uh, on where where does the industry go. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of been a lot of change in the last five years. Things that I would have never thought would have come to fruition. Mike talked about losing a technology like ractopamine. Who would have thought? But it's dictated by the customer, right? We got an international customer that wants ractopamine free pork, and the U.S. has responded to that by removing a technology. Um, that's certainly. I guess for a person that certainly prides himself on helping uh, deliver technology in our system, uh, it seems like we're taking away a pretty effective tool. But ultimately, the customer is, is driving the bus in a lot of these discussions. Um, you know, whether it's antibiotic free pork, whether it's group housing uh, systems, and some of that. And so uh, we've taken the position as it relates to some of those is. We can't afford to, to set idle. We need to start learning about those things because we do see antibiotic free production. Uh, if we follow our poultry operation, uh, they have an antibiotic free uh, line that's been quite successful. It's continued to pick up traction. And the poultry industry, the advantage they've had for some time is they've been able to gain a premium from that product. But what you've seen on poultry is a lot of people now are in antibiotic free. And so, you look over at our friends on poultry and we got to start asking a question, is that going to be us next? And so we started thinking about how do we produce pork that's antibiotic free? And so we've looked at some of those models. They'll scare the crap out of you in terms of how much uh, uh, higher your cost of production is going to be. But that's the stuff we, we can't set idle on. We need to start learning about it. So when that opportunity does present itself with our customer, when they call up and say, hey, can you provide us with antibiotic free or group housed uh, offspring? Uh, we at least have some knowledge and we can fill that gap because that window of opportunity will close fairly quickly. Your guess is good as good as ours. So. Yeah, so on the uh, production partner side has actually worked uh, quite well uh, for us. And it kind of goes back to labor avail availability, um, you know, being part of that. Uh, a lot of our family farms, um, those producers, when we start looking at them versus our internal production, they're very competitive. Um, and it's really created a win win opportunity for both of us. Uh, you know, they own the asset, we provide the inputs. Uh, allows us to leverage capital elsewhere to grow the business because we don't have all our, our money tied up in, in fixed assets. And so that's been a win-win, allows them to get in the, into the pig business, uh, support their operation uh, in terms of overall enterprise, whether they're in crop farming or other livestock production. And then on the grain side, uh, we source uh, directly from, from farmers uh, in, in most cases. Uh, some of our toll mills, you know, they're doing a lot of that procurement um, through farmers and other, you know, uh, grain cooperatives, but uh, in general it's worked well. I mean, that's what's made our business work is uh, working with family farms, and we've mirrored that on the poultry side. Uh, it's the same model. It's, it's production partners uh, on the poultry side as well, as well as some company assets. So it's kind of a mixed model for us.
so I'll make a correction. Uh, that slide I showed was actually uh, the percentage of total sales revenue. It's not 99% grade A pigs. I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think I need to answer your question because we're not at 99% grade A or full A pigs. But it's total revenue on grade A pigs, what they represent compared to non-grade A. So we can't count on our non-grade A volume in terms of overall revenue. It's a, a, certainly 1% of the revenue, but 99% of the revenue is due to grade A sales. Yeah, so, you know, uh, looking at data through uh, our, our data, AgriStats data, uh, we, and it's going to vary, uh, we the market systems are going to be uh, anywhere from 90 to 96 percent grade A um, is what we typically see uh, in the industry. Uh, other people may have uh, different thoughts on that, but that'd be a pretty reasonable range in terms of grade A percentage. Uh, coal percentage, uh, one to two percent on coals or non-grade A would be fairly typical. Okay. When they drive home, they'll be thinking, how'd this guy get excited about pigs? Okay, well, uh, it started really in high school, and I worked for a farmer that uh, backgrounded about a thousand head of, uh, of cattle, and he had 150 sows, and Brent, you're, you know this guy, um, and he had, uh, had the sows, and he didn't care about pigs, so he let me deal with the pigs, and he dealt with the cattle, uh, and I actually had more passion for the cattle when I started, but uh, as I worked more and more with the pigs, I uh, started to grow closer to the pigs and uh, frankly just had ownership within his operation because he didn't want to want to have anything to do with them. I went to college and about two years later he got rid of the pigs so uh, <laughs> that's how uh, it kind of worked out for myself so I've stuck with them. Everybody's ready for ice cream. Pressure of ice cream is still there. Uh, <laughs> Let's give Dr. Gaines a hand. Thank you.